I think it's important for black boys to see black characters that not only they can identify with from a physical standpoint, but also be somebody that can um, make things happen. Welcome to Centered. I'm Jasmine Hood Miller, Director of Community Content and Engagement at Common Sense Media. And I am Felicia Palmer, CEO and founder of Four Control Media. And uh, Jasmine, we're, your, our, we're the host, right? <laughs> yes, we're back as your host here to share meaningful conversations, centering our children, our community, and our values as we raise kids in, in a world of media and technology. You know, uh, it's it's so important the work that that we're doing here. This kind of came about because we saw the vacuum, right? There, there was such a need for our community to be able to have these conversations. So we're always getting together with some fabulous individuals, and today is no different. Today we've brought two guests on. Uh, one is Michael Creekmore. He's a professional school counselor, 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 and licensed uh, professional uh, for elementary school and um he is in clark he started off at clark at the atlanta university uh, with a master's degree in counseling and psychology and basically working with kids of all ages all ages um you've served as a clinical director and clinical supervisor to community health organizations and now you're in the educational facility so now uh we're happy to have you there and you're maximizing uh, and bringing that uh, that uh, those credentials to our school, so welcome. And we also have Derek Barnes, who wrote the New York Times bestseller, the the King of Kindergarten. Uh, if you haven't all caught that one, <laughs> the King of Kindergarten, and I am every good thing. Um, critically acclaimed, multi award winning picture book, uh, Crown, and Ode to the Fresh Cut, um, which received the Newbery Honor, Coretta Scott King Award. Um, and you also wrote a best-selling chapter book uh, series, Ruby and the Booker Boys. Uh, you graduated from Jackson State, uh, the first African-American creative story, creative copywriter hired by Hallmark Greeting Cards, the company, which is in this day and age, it's amazing that we're still breaking boundaries is the first of anything. Uh, and you're, you're a native of Kansas and you're in Charlotte, North Carolina with your wife and four sons. Both of you have four children. And I know that you're well equipped to have this conversation with us today. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. So Derek, um, your books are so uplifting, especially for black boys. And now little black girls too with the queen of kindergarten. Uh, which just also received, among all of your many other awards, our Common Sense Selection Seal. So congrats on that. I am a fan of your book. I actually have your books here with my um, my kids. And I say they're like pep talks, right? Like I have three boys. And when my two oldest were getting their first haircut, we read crowns to kind of hype them up to go to the, the barbershop. Same with the king of kindergarten. My son um, was doing kindergarten virtually at the beginning of the pandemic. And my husband and I wanted to still find some ways to kind of mark those milestones in that strange time. So, you know, with all of these these fun books that you write, where do you get the inspiration and motivation to write books for young kids? Uh, my two top inspirations are, first of all, my um, four sons. I have like a live-in focus group, uh, you know, the Mighty Barnes brothers. Um, Ezra is my oldest son. He's 21. He's a senior in North Carolina A&T. Um, Solo is um, 17. He's a freshman at Fayetteville State. Silas, who's the cover boy of uh, Crown and Nose of the Fresh Cut, he, he'll be a junior this year. And Prince Namdi is the youngest. He's in the sixth grade. So <clears throat> just looking at them and the books that they like to read and just kind of wanting to center being black and being human and being real. And um, when I was first started off in this industry, uh, my first two books came out when I was working at Hallmark Cards. You know, the industry was really different and that was 2004. All of the award winning black books were all centered around slavery or civil rights movement or runaway slaves or black children that live in the projects. And, um, you know, the uh, faces on uh, children's books, you would almost never see a black face on a children's book. This is like 2004. Um, so I wanted to write books where black children, where first of all, I don't even like to mention or, or, 
or even talk about being black in any of my books because being black is all encompassing, right? It's, it's more than just us talking about uh, freedom and again, civil rights and slavery, but it's a way that we walk, it's a way that we talk, it's a way that we love each other. So I always made my mind up that I was gonna write children's books where black children and black families are the norm. You know, the norm has always been white children and white families being centered. So like in the, in the Queen in Kindergarten, you know, you know, her mother washes and sets her hair and braids her hair the night before. Uh, you know, the dad has a red, black and green track jacket on. I just want to normalize how dope we are and how um, and just how real again and how loving we are. Uh, it, it, it took me a while for my my career to take off. Crown was actually my ninth book and my I had a book to come out in 2010. Um, it was uh, We Could Be Brothers. And between 2010, 2017, I didn't have anything out. I, I almost contemplated quitting and not writing anymore. We moved from Kansas City, Missouri to Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I remember when we first moved into this house, this room right here, this is my office. I didn't have any bookcases up. There weren't any albums or any furniture, nothing. This was just a bare room. And I used to sit on this floor and write. One day my, uh, Solo, my second oldest boy, the boy that we just dropped off, he came into the room, he was eating an apple, I was on the floor. And now, during that span, I had wrote like 30 books that nobody wanted. It seems like I had been blackballed almost from this industry, but I kept writing, staying up to two, three o'clock, working on books. And I found myself kind of trying to write black versions of books that these gatekeepers want at these publishing houses. So. You know, the vampire thing was really hot. I wrote a series called Dracula Jones. It was, it was just crazy. And I, I feel like I lost sight of who I was writing for. So one day Solo came in my office and I was sitting on the floor. He was eating an apple. I, you know, I, he looked down at me. He's like, Daddy, you know what you should do? You should write the blackest book ever. You already not getting any book deal. You should just write the blackest book ever. And the brother was right. And about three weeks later, I wrote Crown. And uh, the book just changed my life, man. It changed my life, changed the life of my family. And it really helped to put me back on track, you know, to remember. I, I just, I feel like, you know, like what you do. You have an obligation to always center how amazing and how human it is to be black, not only in this country, but all across the planet. I just feel like we have an obligation, whether you are a dancer, a musician, writer, and I take this obligation extremely serious you know, my body of work is extremely serious to me. And uh, I'm going to always, because of my dear brother Solo, my dear son Solo, and and my other three sons, write the blackest books I can possibly make. I love that. I love that. We um, were just talking about, you know, dropping kids off back to school. It's that, it's that season um, of being back to school. And, you know, as we think about, that as parents, but Michael, Mike, you are a counselor at a school. So how are you preparing your students uh, for this back to school time? In all honesty, um, students and educators, I've been trying to find more of a motivation or trying to motivate students as well as educators to find the joy in education again. Because it's been like <laughs> 2000, 20 when the, pan when the pandemic hit everybody it, it for of course it caught everyone off guard um but by like 20 21 22 everyone was kind of over it right we were kind of over the pandemic we were tired of it it was the war in education on so many fronts um finally we felt like diversity equity and inclusion was finally had finally had a, a, a front row seat to be discussed uh, as amongst one of the most important issues. Um, last year was more about pay. It was more about teachers being overworked and underpaid. So this year, I kind of wanted to take the approach of trying to find the joy um, in education. What makes you happy? What makes you look forward to coming back to school? Yes, we have all endured and been faced with a lot of trauma within the past three years. Absolutely. Without a doubt, everybody, even all of us that are talking here today have endured or 
sustained some type of trauma within the past three years. But I want to try to push past that. And the way I've been trying to do that this year is really through SEL, um, a bigger push in SEL. Um, and when we're talking about SEL, we're talking about what that looks like and how we manage ourselves emotionally to make the best decisions and formulate relationships with others. Um, so that's been my primary focus this year. Um, I've talked a lot about it in different capacities and at different um, conferences, but that's been my main focus and key this year has been SEL and really trying to make it plain and simplify it because a lot of people aren't quite sure what it is. And some people try to gaslight other people by saying it's the same thing as CRT, which it is not critical race theory. Um, they are not one in the same. They're two entirely different things. Um, so that's been my primary focus this year of what I've been trying to do to get everyone geared up for back to school. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up uh, SEL, you know, the, the old idea that there's a part of learning that's not necessarily about the book learning, about the the technical part of learning. It's the social and emo emotional aspects of learning uh, that that are have to some extent been missing because of the pandemic. You know, how is that important for kids? How, how are you seeing now that school's coming back? the gaps there and, and why is it so important and, and what do parents, how do parents kind of relate to this? What role do we play? Well, the first role is understanding what social emotional learning is. Um, and if you look at it in the lens or through the guise of, it's like, a, I often explain it as, it's like a muscle. We're all born with these inherent characteristics and emotions and feelings and ideas and thoughts, right? So social emotional learning is based in the five competencies. It's the self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, responsible decision-making and relationship skills. Those are the five. But within those five, like it happens inherently. Like everyone is born with the capacity to form relationships. Everyone is born with emotions, emotional responses. So the key is to help people develop what that looks like. So if you're looking at it in terms of a muscle, you have to exercise that muscle for it to become stronger. So if you're talking about self-awareness, you're talking about being able to explain and express your emotions. A lot of people are emotionally, you know, they may have difficulty expressing how they feel. It's a known fact that scientifically speaking, men oftentimes more recently have had a diff more of a difficult time expressing their emotions more than women mm -hmm. uh, for better or for worse. But being able to normalize expressing your feelings, expressing your emotions, being aware of those feelings that you have, being able to manage, which is the self-management piece, being, being able to manage yourself when you're feeling a certain way, whether it's angry, sad, um, depressed, happy, excited, being able to manage yourself. So they're mm -hmm. all all five mm -hmm. components are connected. So right. the trick is trying to help parents understand what that looks like, how to normalize it, and how to implement it in their home, in their own life, and within the lives of their child, their children. Yeah. So so over the, the pandemic, you know, I guess that muscle hasn't been exercised as much and and kids are, are in positions now where they are kind of lacking proficiency in how to use that muscle and, and what does that mean uh, when you're having a bad day and how do you cope with with the circumstances that are surrounding the social aspects of being in school and, and especially with black boys you know that also of course having people like you who they can see looks like them in, in their school is is wonderful you know Derek how do you how do you how do your books help with that how do your books kind of you know, make that connection for, for, for black children. Um, I, I'm sure as you know, Michael can uh, uh, vouch for, you know, um, these babies come from a multitude of households and different family uh, setups and family structures. So <clears throat> I think about them whenever I, th whenever I'm in the mode of, uh, you know, character development. Um, I, I saw, 
a trend when I first got into this industry that the middle grade characters were mostly white and they were self-deprecating. And the whole arc of uh, characters, you know, throughout a book is you want to see some growth, whether the book takes takes place within a week or a few years. So I think it's important for black boys to see black characters that not only they can identify with from a physical standpoint, but also see somebody that is uh, that has solutions and is going through the whole problem solving um the whole problem solving um the whole step one to whatever step it takes to accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished and i also want to make sure that my characters no matter what situations they were in are extremely confident and uh, i i think um i think the publishing industry gets that wrong in regards to black boys and black men uh, we are extremely confident sometimes cocky to a fault mm -hmm. and and I think those things are strengths, strengths of ours. So I, I really try to kind of tap into all four of my sons who have four totally different personalities. Obviously, we're not a, a monolith from a personality standpoint, but I just I, I try to create a composite of, of what it means, again, to be a black boy in this country, but also be somebody that can um, make things happen somebody that is um, really open with their emotions. These, this uh, novel that I just finished working on, it took me a whole year to work on this thing. And the uh, lead character is an athlete, but he also wears his, wears his emotions on his sleeve. And he's, he, he's able to express himself where his counterparts and his peers aren't able to do that. So I just want to give black boys a window of and a mirror, obviously, of what they are and what they could possibly become. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think a lot of that, a lot of what we're talking about, this this social, emotional uh, well being, um, is part of the larger conversation of mental health. Um, we are seeing it be more of a topic that can be discussed in our community. That it's not, you know. Um, as like, you know, maybe taboo as it once was years ago where we were afraid to, to say that we um, care about our mental health, that we care about our children's mental well-being, um, that we, you know, seek help outside of ourselves and, and within our community. Um, at Common Sense, we have a whole curriculum for educators about teaching kids how to develop these social and emotional skills and dispositions when it comes to their digital lives. Um, and, and Mike, when you, as a counselor, um, I mean, use, using your counselor hat as well as your dad hat, like you were talking before about, you know, those those five kind of components of um, SEL and that you know, being self-aware, managing your emotions. What are what does that look like um, as far as um, like helping our kids kind of learn those skills and in, in, in practicing them? We were talking about practicing mm -hmm. that muscle. Like what, what does that actual practice look like? Uh, well, it starts with the basic understanding of what your emotions are, right? Like a lot of times you'll find yourself, you'll ask any student on any given day, how do they feel? Most of them will say, oh, I feel good. Okay, what does good look like? Good is not necessarily a feeling. So I think it starts there, like with teaching our students like, emotional responses like what is what is an emotion like talking about the spectrum of emotion i think that's like the first thing that we need to do the vocabulary um, also, yes the mm -hmm. vocabulary is huge Lear learning the verbiage is is extremely important and that can happen that can start as that can start as young as pre-k or kindergarten mm -hmm. um i also think being able to be able to teach in real time like when something happens I mean, there's a restorative component in that, um, which that is, you know, something to discuss at a later time. But I do feel like when something happens in the moment when you're in school or you're at home as a parent and, you know, Derek and I probably can both speak to situations where we've been at home and we've had to kind of diffuse a situation that could have escalated. Having that conversation, what could you have done different? Why were you up? It seems like you were upset. 
if you know it seems like you were upset no i wasn't upset i was this okay so let's talk about it so when you're when you're doing that you're actually starting to practice sel you actually mm -hmm. starting to use some of those strategies you're talking to them and see i don't want it to be lost that i don't want people to get confused and thinking that sel is some brand new thing again it's been around for decades but we've a lot of a lot of people have been doing that and not knowing that that's what they were doing right so having those conversations to de-escalate someone being able to talk through what you're feeling being able to empathize which is a huge component of SEL empathy which the mm -hmm. country itself could use the world could use more empathy right now yeah so being able to identify someone else's emotions like all of those things are SEL so you practice it real time in the moment or if you if the moment doesn't present itself you can cut the TV on to any station like any station now even cartoons and there will be something that happens on that TV that you can have a very rich conversation with your children or your students about. I'm not saying that you got to cut TV on in school, but you can still have those rich conversations based on, um, but regardless of what subject you're teaching in the school system. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it's simple. Um, and I think when, once you simplify it, it makes it easy. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. It's the same way that you would have the conversation with an adult you would have that conversation with a student or a child. You have right. it on their level and they learn more through that experience. Right. You know, it, it's uh, it's interesting you talk about it. it's it's something that we have been doing and now they're coming up with terms and we're thinking, oh, is this something new? But it's it's kind of part of that natural innate thing uh, that we have with our children. Um, I'm just, you know, wondering in your households, for instance, Derek, you know, how, how are you guys instilling these these values of confidence and self-esteem and and really kind of connecting with your children on these, this level? Because oftentimes in our community, there's also this kind of, you know, Michael, you talk about speaking to kids and speaking to them on their level. Oftentimes we have this kind of sensibility that our children are not adults or they not that they don't have that they're not adults, but which they're not but that they don't have um, that conversation can't be had with them in a mature way. So how do you, how do you do that with your children in everyday life? You know, Derek, is it, are you, how are you instilling those values of self-esteem and confidence and, and uh, dealing with their socially, social, emotional issues? And it's so much, um, you know, first, I, I think just from an early age, you know, when my boys are really small, it's, it's, um, I really made it a point to make sure that they understood that they are a part of a tribe. And so we're going to be accountable to each other. You know, I, I call them the mighty Barnes brothers. And so when I say that, it's like they understand what I mean. We, we're talking about togetherness. There's a little bit of, you know, competition from an academic. Um, of course, all my boys played us um, 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 sports, but also modeling this um, high level of, achievement morals you know what i'm saying you you hear people say all the time that the that, that children pay attention to what you do and not so much what you say mm -hmm. and my boys have changed me in so many positive ways and um uh, again it, it's about it's about accountability towards each other uh setting standards for themselves we we try to meet up every wednesday and every sunday you know, before the week starts, sit at the dining room table and, and just talk about the goals for the week, talk about what we want to set. I think I think we are maybe like two weeks away from setting these uh, um, school year goals up. So the boys, even my college students now, write down everything they want to accomplish throughout the school year, put it on your bathroom mirror, put it on the wall next to the light switch in your bedroom, somewhere where you can see it every day. And, and um, we're all... We are always about chasing goals, accomplishing goals in this house. Those are the things that wake you up in the morning. That as um, soon as your feet hit the ground, that's you know those are the first things that you think about. So just holding each other accountable, and also holding me accountable as a father to you know to make sure I'm doing the right things, saying the right things. And um, I saw 
I saw my boy, uh, you know, we went up we went up to his room, the one that uh, we dropped off in college on Tuesday. He had a whole list of um, accomplishments for his senior year, and he checked them all off. You know, that kind of stuff makes yeah. me feel good because I've been doing this since they were like five or six, writing down these goals and making sure that your brother is accountable and holding themselves up to that Barnes Brothers standard, you know? Right. So it's sort of like these rituals and these these uh, protocols that you've established uh, from when they were small. Ha have they, you know, have they grown out? Are you experiencing any, any resistance with children as they mature? They're no longer as uh, amenable to some of these things. I don't feel like doing that or, you know, any of that at all. Or I feel like it's on, uh, it's on cruise control now. I, I went to my okay. eldest boy's dorm at, you know, a&T, he has some goals set up on his um, desk. So I was like, all right, boy, so now we're just on kind of cruise control and, you know, the things that I used to have to do, I don't have to because the two eldest boys uh, make sure to keep the two youngest ones honest. And my, my third boy, he's always on the youngest boy. So uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of these boys. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to get boys to express themselves Emotionally, they are nothing like me. I'm, I, I, you know, wear my emotions on my sleeves. I think a lot of that just comes from being a creative, and they are not creatives. Thank God for that, because I don't want them living in our basement. And they all want to. They, they all want to do. You already it. did the struggle. You did the struggle, so they don't have to do the struggle. That's right. You got it. But I always, you know, in a group setting, I always let them understand that you can always come to me, and then privately, I think they all appreciate being pulled to the side but in a more public setting when you know when the whole family is together I, I i'll make sure that they understand that i lay out all these different subject matters in regards to you know you know feeling depressed or feeling hopeless or maybe having some other type of issue that is just bugging you out and we are one of those families that definitely believe in counseling we don't shy away from counseling if any of us need it that includes me or my wife you know what i mean mm -hmm. but just being able to have that open, you know, relationship and to know, I, I, I always say, I tell these guys, you, I am never going to judge you. You know, and I think that started early off too, that they can come to me and talk about anything because I would never judge them. And uh, I'm going to do everything I can. And, and if I can't help you, then we will find somebody that can. Yeah. You know, you, you seem like, you know, you started off with such a great foundation. Um, a lot of folks, you know, didn't have the the knowledge or the wherewithal to do that with their kids as they were small and, and, and you know, have everything running smoothly at this point. So what would you suggest, you know, for folks who have older kids who, you know, are older and they're not reading the, the, the books that you've written? You know, how do we I have a 17 year old and a 12 year old? You know, what tools could I use to help to instill uh, well-being and, and confidence and esteem in, in my kids? Well, it's, it's really hard to say, you know, because I've, I've, I've started, and again, I started from when they were younger, and obviously, you know, your uh, tools and tactics change as they get older, and I, I think a lot of it is I, I, I just kind of hold them a little bit more accountable than I did when they were younger, um, mm -hmm. and, and to stay on the whole trajectory of setting goals, following goals. You talk about weekly, monthly. Uh, the next uh, quarter or, you know, half a year, make, make sure you set these solid, attainable goals. And um, I, I just I just keep them accountable. And um, yeah. what about you, Michael? I know you, you do, uh, you know, you deal with the younger set. Uh, but, you know, do you, have you seen any any tools and resources that you think kind of translate uh, across age? Oh. Um. There are a few, but before I say that, I want to commend Derek because it's not a lot of black men that are are doing that. Um, well, let me backtrack. Let me let me clarify what I'm saying first and foremost. They're able to be so expressive with their emotions is specifically what I'm talking about. So I want to commend you for that because that that that's major. Um, and I think a, a lot of fathers um, could benefit from being able to be a little bit more expressive. So I just wanted to say that first. So I definitely commend you, brother, for that because it's Thank you. that's that's not easy. Um, now, as far as the 
resources. Um, what I have found that actually can facilitate discussions that we're talking about students, then interactive lessons, um, things like Nearpod, um, as you said, common sense as well. And a lot of it is the dialogue that happens because right. a lot of it is, it happens to be a lot of, a lot of students now, they need that visual. Mm -hmm. Just talking about it is, is good, but they need the visual to go along with it. So a lot of, um, whether it be role play situations, whether it be them actually talking about things that have happened um, and that multiple people are aware of, those things, those situations seem to stick a little bit more with students when you're talking about trying to get them to express and discuss emotion and discuss how they're able to handle um, certain things that happen that come up in their lives. And that's from K all the way through 12 um, mm -hmm. has been my experience. Um, now at home, <laughs> uh, for me, I'm, I would say a challenge that I've been experiencing has been making sure that my, my children are able to express themselves a little more uh, when it mm -hmm. comes to their feelings. Because again, um, it, it can be difficult. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's a generational thing. You know, oftentimes I talk to my parents and they're coming up this weekend and I have to ask them, hey, was I was I like was I like that when I was a teenager? Mm -hmm. Um, because our our son, uh, we have an 18 year old, um, he's going to college. We're taking him, we're taking him next Thursday. Our daughter, who's 16, is a junior um in high school. Our middle daughter is a sophomore in high school, and then our youngest is in third grade. So um, what a um, gap. Yes. We hit the <laughs> we hit the restart button. But um saying all that to say, I think it's extremely important to encourage your 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 children and your students that it is okay to express emotion. Um it's not it's not necessarily the emotion that you express, but it's like what you do when you're expressing that emotion that can get you mm -hmm. into trouble, right? So I think it's important to continue to impress that upon them so they do feel more free to discuss how they're feeling because people, just people in general, are suffering in silence because right. they're choosing not to express their emotions, not to talk about what's really going on. And sometimes just the weight of, re just, just that weight is released when you're able to express how you truly feel. And it may not necessarily be the, you know, the, the game changer or the answer that's going to, you know, move the needle all the way forward. But at least you feel less stress and you feel a little bit more relief that you've, you know, gotten that off off your chest. And now you can start working on the self-management piece, what that looks like to move forward. How can I move forward? Mm -hmm. So those are my thoughts regarding um, regarding that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. I mean, you know, as parents, we we know our children best, and and even you know, kids in the same house can be so different. And knowing how to you know work with one versus another is um, just part of you know part of that parenting journey. Where you might have one kid who is totally you know can tell you everything <laughs> that they're feeling, yes. and then you know another one who will, like barely give you two words. And so it's it's that constant like learning for us as as parents as we're growing with our children um right. and I, I think that all of that is um what we're all you know trying to trying to achieve and and raising confident black children is is deeply important to us um yes. which is why uplifting the the writers the creators the teachers and the artists who are out here giving our kids something to look up to something to aspire to is is a must for us um Mm -hmm. It's literally why we created this series. We partnered, Felicia and I, to do this series to amplify quality media created by and for Black families. Um, so I want to have one last fun question for you guys. I, I hope it's a fun question. <laughs> and um, we, you can each take a turn answering this. And it's, when was the first time you felt like you saw yourself in a, a movie or a TV show or a book character? Um, where you you felt like you like like that's me or like that that character resonated with you. <laughs> I'll I'll start with Derek first. Oh man, um, twice actually. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm a huge hip hop fan from the golden era. When we talk about LL, Run DMC, Eric, Eric being Rakim. So we're talking about in the mid to late '80s, and um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a big, you know, colorism type of cat. But you know, the light skinned brothers kind of had it on lock, like in the '80s. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure. <laughs> so the first time I saw Big Daddy Kane, I, it, I just it just kind of opened up my whole world because I would. I was writing in. I was I was a little you know button MC. My name was Dangerous D. You know in the fourth and fifth grade. So uh -oh. when I saw Queen, I saw somebody that was really confident. That high top fade it looked like a crown, and and he was uh he was everything to me. That was I think I think he's probably still my favorite MC of all time. And then when I got in college, um, not Lorenz Tate's character, but Isaiah Washington's character in um. Love Jones. Uh, he, he was just real cool back, you know. And and Lorenz uh, takes character as well. I, I I just felt like that would have been a community or a clique of people I probably would have hung out with, you know. So, in in college, I swore I was Nina. I had a I had a camera and everything. I thought, <laughs> 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 but I'll, I'll let you answer. My when when was the first time you felt like you saw? yourself in, in a in a character whether it's on screen or in a book or anywhere actually <laughs> um when i saw the movie the best man mm -hmm. um i was in college and it was like my sophomore year in college and i don't want to say which character in the best man because everyone started looking at it <laughs> be like wait a minute which character there were multiple there were multiple people in the best man and i'll just say not um not really Morris Chestnut. I'll just leave it at that. And what I liked about the character is, um, you can probably guess who the character is once I say this, but he was very, um, he was chivalrous. He was, you know, he was kind, he was considerate, he was endearing. Um, and I felt like that, I kind of identified with that character to the point where my nickname at, at one point was, his name in the movie so can i guess is, is that shelby no What's not merch <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh man i feel insulted wow no, i'm trying to, I'm trying to remember the characters <laughs> <laughs> yeah no not merch i don't know i was i was concerned that you were going to be the uh the one that was the cheater and that was like uh, <laughs> i was like wow not that not that guy uh, uh, Terrence, Howard. Was, Terrence Howard, yeah. Yeah, no, Terrence no, Howard. not Terrence Howard. There okay. was nothing kind and endearing about Terrence Howard. No, yeah, no, no. I'm glad. Yeah, he made, he made the series. Really with you. He, yeah, he, he did. He did. Yeah, he, made, he was the glue to me. He was he was hilarious in that series. Yeah, yeah so. he did. He kept yeah, it going. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have guessed that would be you. So, uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting how. Um, how much media is is you know, and it's not it's really truth telling. This is why we do what we do because media shapes so much about what we see in terms of reflecting ourselves. Because oftentimes we're not seeing these types of people in our communities in a meaningful way, people that we can look up to and aspire to be. So that's why you know the work that we're doing is is so impactful. And specifically, I work in in our company. Our flagship is a hip hop site. So when you talk about Big Daddy Kane and and the impact. You know, that's oftentimes the entree that a lot of our people come through and how we see ourselves and where we see we can go. So uh, the impact of media and, and also having people in real life like you both who are you are in the school, you know, Michael and Derek, you're making these characters and you're creating these these uh, these presentations for our children and our, for us to see. It, it's such an impactful, uh, important role. So Jasmine, are we uh, are we uh, rapping? Yeah, I mean, I just want to thank both Derek and Mike for this this great conversation. Um, I could, we could also, you know, if there's any final thoughts you want to share with us, any upcoming projects, um, you know, let us know, and we can. Um, I have uh, my first graphic novel comes out on September 27th. It's called oh, Victory wow. State, and, and I wrote it. Uh, it's about the life and times of 1968 Olympic gold medalist Tommy Smith. 
I had a, a great time um, working with that brother. I went down to Stone Mountain, Georgia, like twice. I went down there three times and just um, just chopped it up with him, sat down in his man cave and, 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 and just had an excellent time. His wife was very gracious and opened up their home to me. Uh, Dawu Anya Buile is the illustrator. He did an excellent job. So I, I have some uh, high expectations for that. I just signed my first animation deal with a huge streaming company for my first cartoon. I'm really excited about that. And I have maybe like three books coming out next year. So extremely busy. We got two college students, so I got to keep cranking it out, baby. Got one yeah, on the way. Right. Another, another one for two years. So. That's dope. That's dope. Mike, any final thoughts or any, anything you want to share before we? Uh, well, my wife and I, we, we do have a book coming out. Um, fall of 2023 school of relationships through ASCD. Um, and it'll just be just a book discussing the, the ins and outs of how to build, maintain and restore relationships throughout school, throughout the school community with all stakeholders. Um, it should make for a pretty interesting and, um, and fun read as some of it is a little bit of our own experience. Um, and a lot of it is more about strategies and techniques to help you facilitate and build that school community that's necessary to thrive and create success successful students great well we will definitely be on the lookout for for all of that um i want to thank you both derek and mike for this amazing conversation i'm so grateful that you took the time to be with us um and we just want to let our audience know that for more family media recommendations please check out commonsensemedia.org uh, leave us a comment with your thoughts on this conversation. Hit the like button and subscribe so you can stay up on all these centered episodes. Thank you. Thank you.